All right. Happy Sabbath, brethren. Good to be with you all. Glad to see you. I always enjoy the time with the saints. I welcome everybody online. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings here from uh, Church of God Woodstock and the Truth on Web Ministries. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, today we are going to be looking at um, by chance or by choice. Uh, essentially, uh, are we born this way? Born that way, as the claim is today. Are uh, people born alcoholic? Are people born a, a homosexual? Um, is it, have you inherited a curse from your fathers before you that needs to be broken? Uh, generational curses. These are things we're going to be looking at today as well and see what the scriptures say on these things. All right. <clears throat> Do these control you? Do the stars have sway? over who you are and what may happen with your day or your year and <laughs> people often have the notion that they do right i grabbed a quick shot uh, this is from about this time last year uh, uh, you know previous a year ago 2016 new york daily news horoscope see what the stars have in store for you this year do the stars have anything in store for you? Do they guide your future? Do they guide your day this day? Many people believe that they do. The fault on our stars. Right? Born under a bad sign. Right? <clears throat> Referring to the zodiac, astrology, horoscopes. People tend to, you know, go run into their papers or, I guess these days, their phones um, to see what the daily prog uh, prognosis is of what's going to happen with their day due to their sign of what time, you know, what uh, date of the month they were born in, what will affect what their day is going to be like. And people, still to this day in this time of science, have faith in this as something that's true, that these stars actually hold sway over who you are and how you behave. Here's some examples here. Um, recurring feelings each sign has every day. The Aries is uh, restless. The Taurus is dignified. The Gemini, wonder. What? I'm not Gemini. I wonder about that. Worst feelings for signs, Aries, anger, Taurus, neglect, Gemini, judgment, cancer, embarrassment. Uh-oh, please don't embarrass me with this because that's my worst feeling I could ever have. Leo, failure. Oh, not the Leo I know. Well. Issues, issues with uh, public toilets. Virgos and Libras have problems. I'm not neither one of those. I have issues with public toilets. <laughs> yeah, doing the dishes. Taurus and Gemini have issue doing the dishes. And how you express love. Fearlessly or physically or... That people, even people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, look to these type of things and f believe that such things are real. That, oh, look, this really describes me. This is, this is how I'm like. And, oh, look, this person was born in the same time. They're like me too. Why did God create the great lights in the skies and the stars? Does the Scripture tell us what they're there for? What's it there for? Signs and seasons to divide 
to let Dana Knight to be give us time. Does it say anywhere that it was there to shape us and mold us into different characters? What's that? In this, this, yeah, the heavens declare His glory. They they are not there to decide our fate or shape our character or our passions. Yet many people have gone this way. Now some have gone from the telescope to the microscope looking for a scapegoat to explain why they do what they do. Our generation is much more in this time of science um, tends to go that way. And I'll remind you too that we are always given a choice in all things. And I'll give you one example here from the Scriptures. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Both you and your that both you and your seed may live, and he says these these heavens and the earth are actually witness of these things that he has given us a choice. The heavens don't control us. We're given a choice of life and blessing or death and cursing, and he's telling us to choose. That you choose, I choose too. <laughs> are we genetically predisposed to certain behaviors this is the idea like i said where people have gone from the telescope to look at the stars and say these stars have control us to now look at the microscope oh it's these genes it's these chemicals that predispose us to being a homosexual or being a drunkard or what have you? <laughs> I'll remind you something I've gone over years ago, and again, um, maybe sometime I'll, I'll get back into uh, visiting um, a worldview series on psychology and psychiatry and the like uh, in the light of Scripture. But uh, as I've gone in the past, psychologists uh, Peter Bregan and David Cohen, he's uh, said in the book, Your Drug May Be Your Problem, said in the field of mental health, not a single physical explanation has been confirmed for any of the hundreds of psychiatric disorders listed in their Bible, the, which is the DSM-4. Now they've gone to the DSM-5. It's the new one out there. But as they have these various disorders and they want to say, oh, these go back to this or this or this or this, they say there is not a single physical explanation for confirmed for any of these things that we claim. We can't say, oh, someone is blank, you know, o, you know, o, uh, ADD because someone is whatever because they, they do not have confirmation of such things. But people still tend to blame it on the brain. So, <clears throat> Psychology and psychiatry um, and the idea of born that way is one of the strongholds in our culture. To the point where even the church has been psychologized and accepted this stronghold as part of their foundation of the way that they think and act. It's become part of their bedrock in the way that they build their worldview, and it shouldn't be because it's opposed to the Scriptures. But we're told to be demolishing strongholds, like Israel at the wall of Jericho. We walk in the flesh. We don't, we don't war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God shows himself in his word. He gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. We are thoroughly furnished unto every good work in this book. It's 
for reproof, for correction, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. He gives us everything that we need to know, to understand him, to know him, and know how he has made us, what our makeup is, what the issue is, and why we do what we do. But there are imaginations of men who, as the scripture says, though God made man upright, man seeks his own inventions and seeks his own ways and distorts the things of God. So we're to cast down such imaginations and every high thing, such as a science, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against the scriptures, and bring into captivity those thoughts back to the scripture. Don't let the world and its ways ensnare you away from the word of God where you believe the scientists of this age and their imaginations that are high things over the word of God. And when we get these things known that we have a, and a readiness to revenge all disobedience, that we go and likewise share the truth and rescue people from false worldviews, that they may stand fully on the word of God. So this issue is the blame game. It goes back to the garden. In Genesis 3, verse 12 to 13, the man said to, to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and out of the eat. Adam, why did you do this? Well, it's the woman that you gave me. And the woman, the God, God says to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, well, it was the serpent. He beguiled me and I ate. It was the blame game. It was the woman that you gave me. Oh, what did you do? Oh, it was the serpent. Everyone's trying to say it wasn't me, it was. However, I want us to acknowledge here as well that all of them were in condemnation. God found them all guilty. It's like um, in Ephesians, where Paul tells the fathers, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. The children's wrath is sin, but so is the fathers provoking them to do so. If you provoke someone to sin, you're guilty of sin, a provocation. If you entice someone to sin by the way you dress or the way you look or the way you flirt with them, you're guilty of sin as well. we got to be careful that we use our vessel for honor the God. And just don't say, hey, well, you shouldn't have, you know, you're the one who lusted. You're the one who got angry. You're the... Well, when you push the buttons, you're also guilty. All right. So <clears throat> I've cited before some, uh, this is from a, a Psycho Heresy News, uh, uh, Psycho Heresy Awareness Newsletter from uh, Martin and Deidre uh, Bobkin. Um, this is back from, uh, I think, in the 90s. Uh, it said, psychological counseling theories and therapies encourage individuals to look outside themselves to explain why they do what they do and why they feel the way that they do because it's not it's not from you know necessarily me it's it's what happened it ain't my fault what caused this why do i do this why do i feel this way who you know it ain't me who made me do this the blame game stall started in the garden of eden as we just saw and it's continued throughout the centuries it gained status this last century through sigmund freud and his followers who placed the main source of adult problems back into one's early childhood. The parents, especially the mothers, because, you know, Freud, if those aren't familiar with Freud, you can search that out. He had issues with mom. Um, the parents, so especially the mothers, were the culprits, and, of course, the parents were simply passing along their own problems. Now, there is, depending on how you read that and understand it, there is some truth along that people can learn behaviors quote unquote, you know, monkey see, monkey do not say we're monkeys, not on that, but the, you know, this borrowing the adage. 
Yeah, people people can learn bad behavior from who they hang out with. The scriptures do warn us about be careful who you choose for friends because they will drag you down. All right? But did the parents hand down the problems just by having the children? And it's handed down through sperm and egg. No, that is not, and we're going to find it's not what Scripture says uh, either. Um, so they said, go back to generation, generation, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Although Freud, uh, through Freud, the blame game was dressed in medical garb and is now given, uh, now risen to great prominence in the present therapeutic culture of our psychological society. Yes, we are in a very much of a psychological society, therapeutic culture everywhere. It's, it's people, it's a given. People, most people don't even question. Uh, it, they look at strange at me for speaking against such things. That I'm the strange one because I don't believe in these labels and, and diseased by decree. Uh, all these things that they say. It, that's how, what great prominence has come to. Because this world's been flipped upside down by these high ideas of men. So the idea of uh, born that way is very prominent. Uh, to the point there was a, a real famous song uh, not so many years ago, Born This Way, uh, Lady Gaga promulgating the idea that, hey, look, I was born a lesbian, or I was born a bisexual, I was born a homosexual, I was born of this, born of that. That's what we are. We're born that way. Is this what the Scripture teaches? Is this even what science really shows? No. Neither nor. The APA back in 98... Uh, that's the uh, psychi Psychiatry Association there. They had said there was considerable recent evidence to suggest, be careful when you always read these things too, look for words like, well, we think, or perhaps, or maybe, or it seems. Here the key word is suggest. There is considerable recent evidence to suggest that biology including genetic or inborn hormonal factors, play a significant role in a person's sexuality. This was the claim back in 98. However, they have themselves flipped that on its head. Okay. There is not evidence to suggest biology, including genetic or inborn hormonal factors, play a significant role in a person's sexuality. Have you guys, um, I, again, I, I had spoken on this some years ago. Perhaps you guys may remember he's talking about Simon LeVay. Uh, he is a uh, gay rights activist. Uh, he's a neuroscientist. Okay. Yeah, you would think he's related to Anton LeVay. <laughs> uh, still, yeah, still Luciferian, I guess, in a sense, huh? being gay rights activist. Uh, at the Salk Institute in La, uh, La Jala, California, he made international headlines back in 91. He reported that a certain area of the brain tended to be smaller in homosexual men than in heterosexual men. Oh, look, there's a smaller, there's this part of the brain that's a little bit smaller in homosexuals versus homosexuals. Therefore, hey, this is probably evidence that homosexuals, it, it, it's a physical thing. It's the brain that causes it. Yeah. Although LeVay has been cautious about interpreting his results, he has suggested that since this particular area of the brain may be closely connected to sexual behavior, again, maybe closely uh, connected to sexual behavior, it could well affect sexual orientation. LeVay had autopsied the brains of 19 gay men, homosexuals, sodomites, and 16 heterosexual men and six women. doesn't say what their sexual uh, point was with the women, 
The portion of the brain Simon LeVay reported to be smaller in gay men, known as the third interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus, INA3, is closer in size to the corresponding area in the female brains. So he said, look, the homosexuals, this, their INA3 is more like the size of the INA3 of a woman, therefore they cannot help but be effeminate. Well, there's a lot of assumptions in this. A lot of assumptions. <clears throat> this brain research has been challenged on several grounds. Three of the homosexual men in LeVay's study, for instance, had INA three areas as large as one of the heterosexual men. Oops. And two of the presumably heterosexual women, same size. Oh, so they had larger ones than the other women. Another problem was that all the homosexual men and some of the heterosexual men in the study had died of AIDS. And no one knows what the effect of AIDS and its complications have on the size and shape of a dying brain. Who's to say that their way of life or the results of their way of life didn't result in their INA3 being affected? All right? Give you a simple example. Like, think about, like, ever read about those stories where Someone's working on a car and the jack drops and it drops on the, you know, mom or dad and all of a sudden little kids out there pick, you know, whatever. Someone's out there has like superhuman strength, lifts the car. It's because adrenaline's pumping. Now, what caused what? What caused the influx of adrenaline in the body? Was it not caused by what physically is going on? The kid sees it in shock. It affects the brain chemical level. So things that happen could affect our levels within our body it can cause something to produce or lack to produce based on our actions not that those things cause our actions. the adrenaline didn't cause her to want to pick up the car or you know whatever it came as a result of oh. all right so it's a matter of you know stop wagging the dog we're, we're want to blame things on chemicals and realize maybe the chemical difference is because of what happened it didn't make what happened happen but it's the other way around. So they uh, continues, uh, Martin and Deidre say, uh, nor has anyone demonstrated the relationship between INA3 and the sexual behavior in humans. So that was one of the assumptions there. Well, he thinks it may be, however. What's more, the only, uh, only the male AIDS patients in LeVay study and not the uh, presumed homosexuals who died of other causes had been asked their sexual orientation before they died. Therefore, the results are inconclusive. Um, again, all the assumptions. Why, why is the INA different? Is it, was it caused? You know, don't put the cart before the horse. Now, LeVay himself said, I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way. The most common mistake people make in interpreting my work, nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. So here, this is a homosexual activist who when he first put a study, all the homosexual activists are along with him. Oh, look what he found. Yay, here's our Messiah to show her. He's like, Wait, you guys are misinterpreting my work. I did not say this. I did not find that. There is nothing I'm saying. There's nothing I found that shows homosexuality is genetic. That there's a gay part of the brain. <clears throat> As I said, the APA later had... Uh, flipped on their views. They had said there is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, so uh, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, 
No findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Many think that nature and nurture both play complex roles. Oh, so their evidence that they talked about back in the 90s, now uh, not so much. We don't know what factor or factors bring this about. So what about twin studies? My book in here. Everything about twins? In this, in the light of this, if you think about a twin, a, 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 and I, when I'm not talking about, I'm talking about identical twins, not just fraternal twins. And I, and identical twins, you have one sperm and one egg, so it's the same genes. And that egg, when they come together, it splits. So you have exact copies of each other. Now, when twin studies. You see that these theories that they say for something being genetic, this blows that whole concept out of the water. I'm going to read from a book called uh, Blame It on the Brain from uh, Ed Welch. This is from uh, page 167, uh, a little bit of 168. He says, uh, another approach to studying the biological basis of homosexuality is to observe the incidence of homosexuality in families and twins. A favorite example is the research done by Michael Bailey and Richard Pillard. The study reported that 56 homosexual men who were identical twins, that 52% of them, so 29, had a twin brother who was also homosexual. Oh, that sounds like big numbers. Wow, okay, so in little over uh, a little over half were homosexual if if their twin brother was homosexual, they were two. Hmm, wow. And among non-identical twins, the rate was twenty two percent. Oh, so they you know they were woo mates. Not identical, but they were woo mates, and among them, twenty two percent if one was homosexual. 22% of them was as well. But non-twin brothers, the rate was 9%. And among adopted siblings, the rate was 11%. Hmm. The research group also found comparable statistics with females. So here's what you would expect, though, with genetic components of sex, uh, homosexuality. The closer the genetic relationship, the higher the rate of shared homosexuality. But if you notice the thing there where I just said uh, non-twin brothers, the rate was 9%, but adopted siblings, the rate was 11 So <laughs> you had a greater chance of having an adopted sibling who was a homosexual than having a non-twin sibling who was homosexual. However, this study, like LaVeige, produces no firm conclusions. Even if you ignore the sampling biases, uh, such as they recruited through homosexual publications, that's how they chose their people, and the fact that no other researchers outside of this team have found such high percentages, of 52% and all that, amongst identical twins. So they're the only ones to get that higher percentage. Why? Because they look for all homosexual men. That's how they recruit people. Hey, come here and be part of the study. Um, but that's inconsequential. The, uh, it, it's because identical twins typically have profound influence on each other. If one twin is introduced to something new, it's likely he will, be in, he will introduce the other twin to that activity. Uh, moreover, why did the genetically unrelated adopted brothers of homosexuals have such an allegedly high rate of homosexuality? Like I said, that 11% versus the 9% of the other. Their 11% incident rate is five times what you would expect because the incidence of actual, active homosexuality is generally to be about 2% in the general population. How did this study come up with 11% for, you know, for adoptive kids when the general percentage is 2%? Uh, the study would be better used to in, uh, support the influence of peers in the development of homosexuality versus genetics, that it's your peers can affect you in what you do not that your genes do. 
Uh, researchers realize that they all, all they proved is that homosexuality is not caused by genetics. If genetics were the only cause, the concordance rate for identical twins would be 100%, right? If, they're, if it, the cause for homosexuality is genetics, and we have two beings, two humans who are genetically identical, and one's a homosexual, 100% of the time, the other one should be a homosexual too. Because they are genetically identical. If one is a quote-unquote alcoholic, a drunkard, the other one must be too. Because they're genetically identical. If the alcoholic theory, the homosexual theory, the born-that-way theory is correct, but it doesn't match reality. Remember what truth is? Truth is that which corresponds to reality. Reality is identical twins, so this is not the truth. They show that you are not born that way. I personally know identical twins, one of which chose to be a lesbian. The other one chose not to be a lesbian and is married and has children and has no inclination to desire women. Identical twins. So what does it say to the scriptures? What does the scripture say about us and our makeup and how he's made us to be? Here's our inborn sexual identity according to the scriptures. Genesis 2, uh, verse 18 and 21 to 24. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help that is meet for him or suitable for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And he brought him or her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So here is the nature he made of Adam and of Eve. That man, woman were to be one flesh. He saw Adam's desire. He said, hey, Adam's alone. It's not good that man's alone. Let me fulfill Adam's desire and gave him a woman. As people often say, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Or Madam and Eve. All right? <clears throat> but the scripture goes on. We see in Leviticus 18.22, You shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So we see the natural course that he says is, man to lay with womankind. That's natural. That's natural. She says, so you shouldn't do what you naturally do with a woman with a man. This is said to men, of course, getting the right perspective on this. Men don't lie with men like you would with a woman. Because the way you do with a woman is natural. That's the way God set uh, the course in order. And again, Leviticus 20, verse 13, if a man also lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination and they shall be put, surely be put to death and their blood shall be upon them. So is God just? Yes. Is God holy? Is God pure? Is God good? All the time and all the time. Amen. So he has made man in such a way that man is to lie with woman when, he are, when they are made one flesh in the marriage covenant. But he says if, they lie with, if, a, if a man lies with another man in that same manner, that he has committed an abomination. And God, has, in his just judgment, has said that such a man would be put to death in the, in the theocratic nation of Israel at that time. And Eventually, such a man will be put to death in the lake of fire, which we'll read about in the New Testament scriptures as well. But God has decreed such a action is not, not only not natural and not the way he made man to be, 
is an action that is criminal and deserving of death. He didn't make man that way. In fact, he says, their blood shall be upon them. He doesn't say their blood's upon my hands because I made them that way. Their blood's upon themselves because they have chosen a way to themselves that is criminal and abominable, and it's their fault. Romans chapter 1, this very, uh, one of my favorite chapters of Scripture, Romans is just an incredible book. But in, in Romans 1, he goes through and he explains what happened to this world that God created and how he originally made man upright, but man chose his own ways and brought sin in and tainted it and twisted everything. And it's distorted such things and it's distorted the hearts of men. And God eventually steps back and doesn't, he doesn't, hands that are fighting against his hands, he says, he'll step back and say, okay, have your way. And they fight against him, okay, have your way. This is what we'll find in the words where it says God gave them up to or God gave them over to. doesn't mean that God forced their hand. It's like Job when he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull back the fence. He isn't forcing anyone to do anything. He has given us free moral agency. So, the Scripture says that uh, in Romans 1, that He made Himself known to all mankind through the things that He's made, those heavens that declare His glory. Right, Tim? They... So through creation, God has made himself known to all, so the whole world's without excuse, right? Um, and that's back in uh, 18, 19, and 20 of Romans 1. But he says in verse 21, because uh, when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, and they weren't grateful. And that's where mankind slides into darkness, it begins with not acknowledging God, not glorifying Him as God that He is, and not being grateful towards Him. That's where you begin to fall into the realm of idolatry and darkness. And he says, because of these things, they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And from there, they professed themselves to be wise and they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts in creeping things in verse 23. So he says, basically what it was, you stopped acknowledging God as God. You stopped being grateful for the providence of heaven. And you became an idolater because you became a worshiper of self. That obviously, you're thinking on yourself, hey, I don't got to be thankful to God. I'm, it comes to self. And so he says, that's exactly what you've done. You have now changed my glory into images. They were, they were turned over to idolatry because that's what they chose for themselves. Because they stopped acknowledging God. And if you cease to worship God, you don't worship nothing. You worship anything. And he says, verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, Who changed the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Much like our culture today, that it's so sex-saturated, we are sexual idolaters in our culture today. Where the natural use has been made into a giant idol that people all bow down to. Like I said, love, what people say is love is lust. 
and of self. And lust knows no satisfaction. And as they sought for further satisfaction in their lust with sexuality, just like a drug. You know, I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it. So a little got more and more, right? Because you're looking for that satisfaction that you're not getting. So more and more and more. Something new, something new. And to the point where there's something new was, well, let me try it with one of my own sex. Their perversity was so perverse it got to that point. Because they were worshiping the human body. And so God said, well, be it. Give you over to it. And so then God gave them up to their vile affections. Notice what God says of it. It's vile affections. It's not the affections He set in the heart of man from the get-go. It's not the affections He gave to Adam or, or to Eve. It's vile affections. Perversities. For even the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So hey, guess what? The Word of God clearly says it is against nature. Homosexuality is not nature-based. It's not genetic. It's against nature for a woman to lust a woman or a man to lust a man. It says, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one towards another. Men working Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which is suitable. Well, initially that was God giving them over to it. There's, that's part of the recompense they're getting. You want to get that? Boom, you're going to go into darkness. You're going to increase in vain imaginations. You're going to increase in darkness and blindness. And ultimately you're going to see a great light you never want to see as it engulfs you like a fire. And there could be other recompenses in our day and age. AIDS, amongst other diseases. Paul told the Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, Know you not that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God don't be deceived that fornicators. Now again, here's something that a lot of Christians want to sit there and point the finger at homosexuality, but guess what? If you're a male and you're fornicating with a female, you're no more righteous than they are. Fornication is also condemned and you will not be in the kingdom of, of heaven, the kingdom of God. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, the effeminate, be it the transgenders, the cross-dressers, the abusers of themselves with mankind, the homosexuals, nor thieves, the covetous, drunkards, no revilers or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now here again, we see God condemning homosexuals, the effeminate drunkards. Things that our society says is of no choice for the people. And if you have been sucked into that, and you accepted that, I want you to stop and look at this, because what you're saying then, without realizing it, you haven't probably juxtaposed these two ideas, is that you're saying God is unjust. Because God condemns this stuff and says these people have made a choice and they've gone against nature and they've chosen for themselves death. Remember I said before you, life and death, choose. Says these people won't inherit the kingdom of God. I know this world wants to say alcoholism is a disease. It's called being a drunkard, and it's a sin. God doesn't condemn somebody for getting the flu, for getting cancer, 
He doesn't condemn someone for having a disease or an illness. He condemns people for choosing sin. <coughs> what is a drunkard? Well, it's much like we read in Romans chapter 1 there. Just like the homosexual who's, or the sexual immoral, they've been given over to it. So, okay, fine to the point that that's going to be, your, that's what you're going to turn to for joy or for peace or for comfort. Then that's going to be your God and I'll give you over to it and you're going to be enslaved to it. I'll tell you one thing we were hardwired for. We are hardwired, hardwired for worship because we were made to worship God. And again, if we don't worship him, we're going to worship anything and everything. First Timothy. <clears throat> Paul tells Timothy, says, knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, the profane. And he goes on to list some of these. Who are these lawless, disobedient, ungodly, sinners, unholy, and profane? He says they're murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers. Manslayers in, in general, it doesn't matter if it's just your mom or dad, anyone who you're murdering. The whoremongers. And for them who defile themselves with mankind. That's homosexuality. He says homosexuality is lawless, is disobedience, it's ungodly, it's sin, it's unholy, and it's profane. And it's contrary to sound doctrine. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, it's contrary to sound doctrine. What is, and what is this book good for? Sound doctrine. So homosexuality is contrary to the Word of God no matter how much people today want to twist the Word of God to want to make it say otherwise. Jude, verse 7. Jude says, Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities around them, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the punishment of eternal fire. <laughs> yes, the sin of Sodom is sexual immorality. Yes, violence and other things amongst them. But sexual immorality, where the very word sodomy comes from, referencing homosexuality, and even sodomy amongst male, female. But they're set forth as an example of eternal fire and what's going to happen upon those who likewise live as the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites. The kingdom of God is not going to be inherited the lake of fire is by your own choice. So why does mankind sin? I said earlier from Ecclesiastes that God has made man upright. That's uh, the last verse in Ecclesiastes 7, if you're wondering where that is. Uh, I think it's like 729 or something like that, around if you want to pull it up. Um, oh, you did? Okay. Um, but man has chosen for himself his own ways outside of what God has said for us and has made us. But the Scripture also tells us why we sin. Jacobus. Chapter 1, uh, James, uh, thanks, Ron, uh, says in 13 to 17, Lo, uh, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. Hey, God may be this way. No. You're not tempted by God. God can't be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. It's your own inventions of your heart that you've chosen. Then lust, when it is conceived, it bears sin, and then sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. 
This is the Word of God. Generational sins, generational curses, are they biblical? This is uh, an idea often promulgated amongst uh, Pentecostal or charismatic churches, uh, the demon hunters. You know, there's, the reason you sin is because you have a, the demon of this or the demon of that or the demon of this or this curse is upon you. We need to break this curse and this demon. Of the... Is that biblical? Ezekiel 18, verse 1 to 4, says, You use this proverb, we're going to use part of this here, uh, concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the fathers have done something, and has caused us to have to feel the, ah, oh, the dad's, ah, oh, on the kid's behalf. It's a curse. I'm cursed by you eating that grape. This is what they're teaching amongst the, the charismatic Pentecostal groups. Is that correct? Is that God's viewpoint on us? Now, many, many people will base it on this idea. And again, a lot of people don't stop and think these verses through and what it's saying. So I'll let people, oh yeah, right away, hey, doesn't it say it in the commandments right there in the second commandment? Yeah, here's from the second commandment, Exodus 20, the commandment against idolatry. It says in verse 5 and 6, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Is that evidence for generational curses, generational sins? And that's why you sin, because God made it happen because he'll visit the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. That's why you sin, because your fathers did it three to four generations ago. Is that what that verse says? No. Hmm. Hmm. How about this one? Exodus 34, 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. And by will no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, upon the third and fourth generation. Huh. So is it God causing the children's children and the children after that and the children after that to sin? Hmm. How about this one? Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy and forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty. Notice the context is always right in there, the same concept. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third, fourth generations. Hmm. Does this say that? Does this say that the third and fourth generations, their sin is caused by the fathers? How about this one? Deuteronomy 5, verse 9 to 10. I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, in showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You see the juxtaposition here, too, between those who hate him and those who love him? So is this, is this evidence of a generational curse and a generational blessing? Well, if you love me, then therefore your grandkids and great-grandkids are going to be blessed too. Is, is that the case of what's going on? We see this phrase a lot in all those scriptures there. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. What does this mean? What does it mean to visit the iniquity? Does that mean the iniquity your fathers were doing, I'm going to have you do it too because it was in their hearts, therefore it's going to be in their sons, and then their sons, and then now your, your hearts because your fathers did it, and that's how we're going to visit the iniquity? Is that what this scripture means? 
Does it even come close to saying that? Is it saying they have, is it saying, what's it saying? Well, what's it mean by visiting the iniquity? Does it say that iniquity is going to be continuing because I made it such? Or is he talking more about judgment? Penalty. Let's go back to Ezekiel 18, 1 to 4. We'll look at this, the full 1 to 4 here. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean you that you use you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? This is a proverb being used in Ezekiel's day. And God's asking them, Why do you guys say this proverb? Is it true? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on the edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverbs in Israel. Behold, all the souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, also the soul of the Son is mine, and the soul that is sinning, it shall die. And you guys are putting this, you guys are blaming, you're trying to say that I'm killing the Son for the sin of his father, I'm telling you, it's the soul that sins that I will put to death. It was the parents you gave me. It ain't my fault it was mommy. It was daddy. It ain't my fault. And he's saying no. The soul that sins will die. Drop down to verse 14 to 17 there. It says, Now lo, if he beget a son that sees all of his father's sins which he has done, and he considers, and he doesn't, he, does, he doeth not such like, he doesn't imitate his father's ways, he has not eaten upon the mountains, neither has lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, he has not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has he oppressed any, has not withholden the pledge, neither has he spoiled by violence, but he has given his bread to the hungry, he has covered the naked with the garment, he has taken off his hand from the poor, and hath not received usury or increase. But he has executed my judgments and has walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. So he's saying, look here, you can have a man who's wicked. He's a father, and he does all this wicked, enough, wicked stuff where he's an idolater up upon the, every high mountain, upon every high hill, worshiping all the idols. He's defiling his neighbor's wife. He oppresses the poor, taking pledge from them and doing things he ought not. But his son, as he grows up seeing his father doing all these things, his son of his own genetics doesn't bear those same things. He looks at him and considers what his father's doing. He sees everything his dad does and he considers them and that's not the way to walk. And the son chooses to walk in the way of God, not in the ways of his father. And God says, he's not going to die because of his father's sins. He's going to live because the son's done what's right. The Notice the son considered. He made a choice. He consciously looked and made a choice. I see this all the time with people. With you know, their parents. Well, my parents reacted this way, and so they either have a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, you know, my parents used to beat me, therefore I'll, I'll never lay a hand on a kid. Uh, or my, you know, my parents were crackheads, therefore, and one will grow up, one kid will grow up to choose to be a crackhead, one will choose not to. It's a matter of considering and choosing what you want. Jeremiah 31, verse 29 to 30, he says, In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die for his own iniquity. 
everyone, every man that has eaten the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on the edge. And ain't upon the children. See, the results or effects of sin are not handed down to descendants genetically or legally. The negative effects of sin are handed down as learned behavior. Once again, you could choose, you can learn to do or not to do. We just read there that son considered this father and chose not to. The phrase to the fourth generation refers back to the great grandfather and indicates the influence a man has on his son, his grandson, and the great grandson. It only extends as long as he's living. His ability to transmit his ungodly ways to his descendants ceases when he dies. During his life, however, his descendants can choose whether they follow in the wicked ways or turn to the Lord. Therefore, we are neither responsible for our forefathers' sins, nor are we doomed and destined to repeat them. We do not have the legal guilt or the genetic tendency that proponents of the generational curse teach. Jeremiah 32, 18 says, You show loving kindness unto thousands and recompensed, recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is his name. Here's what the idea is. Isn't that, here's the recompense. That's a payment for the sins. We've talked about this in times past that when God brings judgment on a nation, that judgment isn't going to be the time when we're standing there before the great white throne. That's when we're individually judged. Judgments on the nation happen in this lifetime. Sometimes it's swift, sometimes it's not. We know the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, were living in sin. And Abraham was told, hey, this is all going to be yours. The fourth generation will be yours, but right now the sin of the Amorites is not to the full. There's come a point where God's going to, his patience and his willingness to see where people are going is going to come to it. Now's the time to step in. Now's the time for recompense to this generation. He will have mercy and patience sometimes on a generation but still bring that judgment on the next if the next continues in the ways of their father. Here's from Young's literal translation. I, Jehovah, am, am your God, am a zealous God, charging iniquity of the fathers on the sons and the third generation on the fourth of those who hated me, doing kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So again, the iniquity, he isn't saying he's made the third and fourth generation continue in that iniquity. He's saying he's bringing, he's going to finally, he's going to take that iniquity and he's going to punish his son Israel for those things. Remember, this is all the works of Jacob. This is the man Jacob. And what Jacob did at one point in time, Jacob's going to get spanked for down the line. Sometimes it doesn't happen immediately. Sometimes it may be a, the next day, which would be the next generation, as it were. You know, just like I've talked in times past about Jacob. Jacob. Jacob vowed a vow that he says, hey, if you do this and that, and you make this land mine and do all that, surely you will be my God, and I will give you a tenth of all. Jacob vowed a vow regarding the tithe. Said, if you give me this land. Well, Jacob never was given the land. He was a stranger and a pilgrim in it, but it was never his. Oh, but wait, Jacob was given the land. When? In the fourth generation, when Moses let the children of Israel out, 40 years, brought them into the land, they are given the land. Now Jacob had to fulfill his vow. Now he surely had to give a tenth of all unto the Lord. Right? Jacob, Jacob's vow is being fulfilled by the tithe law. Jacob is still paying what he said. There's a times where Jacob's done wrong and Jacob's still going to be recompensed. Sometimes it'll be a next generation. 
But it's because the next generation is only consider, uh, continuing those things. Think about even when they left in the wilderness. I think I have that in here. I'll get there in a moment. Uh, let me add in here Adam Clark's commentary. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. He says this, this necessarily implies if the children walk in the steps of their fathers. Because no man's going to be condemned by divine justice for a crime of which he never is guilty. We just saw that in Exodus 18, right? So he's saying when he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers to their children, it's because the children are still continuing in those sins, and now he's going to bring judgment. Um, idolatry is, however, particularly intended. Again, because the first law is cited right there in the law against idolatry, second commandment. Uh, and visiting the sins of this kind refers principally to national judgments. Like I said, this is judgment upon the nation, not individuals. By withdrawing the divine protection, the idolatrous Israelites were delivered up to the hands of their enemies, from whom the gods in whom they had trusted could not deliver them. It continues, this God did to the third and fourth generation, successively, as may be seen in every part of the Jewish history, particularly in the book of Judges. And this, at last, became the grand and the only effectual and lasting means in his hand of their deliverance from idolatry. It's well known that the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites were so completely safe from idolatry, never more to disgrace themselves by it as they had formerly done. These national judgments, thus continued from generation to generation, uh, appear to be what are designed by the words in the text, visiting the sins of the fathers upon the children. He's coming in for a national judgment, not an individual handing down, you must do this sin because your dad did. Okay, here's what I was just alluding to right before the clerk uh, there. Numbers 14.33, your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. Because remember, he brought that generation out. The generation refused to believe. They did not walk in faith. Joshua and Caleb did. Said, oh, we can take them. The Lord's with them. Oh, no. We're like grasshoppers to them. No way. Ain't going to happen. He said, all right, fine. You don't believe me? You're going to wander the wilderness until your carcasses drop. Now, the children in this case had to bear that because they were the ones who had to walk and with their faithless fathers till they dropped. But it doesn't mean they had to continue in the sin of their fathers. Otherwise, they would have still continued in the wilderness, but God eventually brought them in. First Samuel 15, 2 to 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, and how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but both slay a man and woman, infant, suckling, ox, and sheep, camel, and ass. Now, so Amalek, this is back in the days of David, or I'm sorry, back in the days of Moses, when these things went on, when he came up out of Egypt. But here in 1 Samuel, he's saying, hey, what Amalek did, now he is going to pay for what he did because the Amalekites were still enemies of Israel at this point. And so now he's saying, now because of what they did way back then, way back then, what Amalek did, now Amalek's going to pay. Now God's coming in with his rod and saying, here's what's going to happen. Were they doomed to be enemies of uh, of Israel because of what Amalek did. No. If they would have turned, any nation that turns, God will accept. First Kings 21 to 29, seest thou uh, how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring evil upon his house. What, Abraham, what Ahab had done had warranted repercussion. Ahab humbled himself. He said, okay, I'm not going to bring it in your days, but knowing his son's days, there's still going to be evil happening. He said, okay, I'll bring it in your son's days. Does that mean his son was being reproved for what Ahab did? No. 2 Kings 23, 26, Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. You can go in and read that whole concept there with what was happening with King Manasseh. 
and the reproof will come in again. It's going to come in as a, these things are going to be done nationally. Consider Daniel. We're going to hop and skip through a Daniel 9 here, verses 4, 5, and then 7 through 9. Daniel said, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. He's like praying the second commandment right here. Uh, he says, We have sinned and committed iniquity and acted wickedly and rebelled and turned aside from your commandments and ordinances. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away and all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which you, they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Did Daniel rebel against God? Do we see any evidence of that in the Scriptures? But here Daniel is recognizing the national sins of Israel and why the punishment was to come upon them and why he was brought to Babylon. Did any of that make Daniel a sinner? Did it change who he was inside? So, no, it didn't. Isaiah 65, verse 67, Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosoms, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Here again, we're seeing nat national condemnation. Here's your iniquities and iniquities of your fathers together, and I'm coming in to recompense those things. This is what the scriptures mean when I talk about visiting the iniquity. Here again, New Testament, Matthew 23, verse 34 to 36. Wherefore, behold, I will send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zachariah, the son of Zachariah, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Truly I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. There's recompense from the killing of the great prophets from Abel up until Zechariah, last mentioned in Second uh, Chronicles at the, the end of Old Testament canon. So he says the blood from A to Z is coming upon this generation because they all continued in these things. The, the whole time he says, you know, you admit you, you're that you're the sons of those who killed all the prophets. It's still you. It's still you. <laughs> You've the been the one doing this the whole time. And the judgment's going to come. Jeremiah 18, verse 7 to 10 says, At what instance I shall speak concerning the nation and concerning the kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull it down, to destroy it, that if that nation against whom I have pronounced, if they turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do to them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning the nation, concerning the kingdom, to build it and to plant it. If they do evil in my sight, that will obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I had said I would benefit them. So God, will, as the scripture says, several places, he raises up kings and brings them down. He brings up the powers that be and brings them down according to his will. And he decides who's going to have a blessing and who's going to have a cursing. But he does it with justice, with just holiness and honesty in equal weights in the balance. Truth is, homosexuality is a sin. Drunkardness is a sin. Yeah, whatever. God is not a respecter of persons. He does not make one man sin and another not sin. 
God is love. He does not require us to do something that he's made impossible through genetic predisposition. God is just. If God genetically predisposed certain men to sexual immorality, he can't require abstinence on such conduct because he's a just God. Sin results from lust, not from genetic predisposition to sin. We are not born with a sinful sexual orientation or any type of sinful orientation in that matter. Rather, we adopt sinful orientations after we lust after sinful things and give in to our sinful desires. God wants everyone to be saved. Therefore, he does not make us sin through genetic disposition. Men walk in sin because of their hard hearts, not because of genetic predisposition. In Ephesians, flip there, Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 17 and 19, Paul says, This I say, uh, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who be in past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. So Paul says a person's thinking is futile because his understanding is darkened. Much like we said in Romans 1. Understanding becomes darkened because they have stopped the worship of God as God and started to worship the, crea of the creature more than the creator. Understanding is darkened because he's excluded from the life of God. He's excluded from the life of God because of his ignorance. He is ignorant because of the hardness of his heart. He is hard-hearted because he has given himself over to licentiousness to work all uncleanness with greed. He desires it. And is therefore given over to it. I know we saw the scripture earlier, but I want to add on here the verse of hope here at the end as well. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. That fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, the effeminate, the abusers of themselves of mankind, thieves and the covetous and the drunkards, the revilers, the extortioners, and none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul, writing to the brethren in Corinth, says, these things I just said, some of you were these. There was brethren in Corinth who were former homosexuals, who were former adulterers, who were former fornicators, who were former drunkards. And Paul says, this is what you were. But God has changed your genetic structure. No, it doesn't say that, does he? When you repented and were baptized of your sin, did that change your genes? Is your DNA rewritten? No. Sin isn't from our DNA. Mm -hmm. How are they changed? Because they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were washed they were sanctified and they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And it changed them, gave them a new heart that was malleable for God. And as you just mentioned, Tim, 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. People, there's no excuse for us to continue in sin. 
God has given us both the desire and the ability of his good pleasure, to do of his good pleasure, and to say no to ungodliness by his grace. All right, there is no curse that binds you to sin. You were, you, there is nothing that prevents you from righteousness. You were bought at a price. You are a slave, but a slave to God. All right? You have been set free from bondage to sin. You have been set free from Egypt. Pharaoh and his army are all destroyed in the Red Sea. They have no say over you, no control over you. It's all dead. All right? Praise be to God for His mercy and His grace and His power and the new heart and the new spirit He's given us whereby we can truly walk in holiness and righteousness. And anyone else can freely drink of that water and be made whole. Hallelujah.